o eh, si estamos o no ante un ente alienígena. Ya contamos con nosotros con A.B. Loeb, físico, científico de la Universidad de Harvard. Hi, A.B., thanks for being here in, in Authors TV. It's a pleasure having you here. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I would like to ask you about the Tracy Atlas, uh, you know, a uh, lot of media talking about it. Uh, what do you think about Tracy Atlas? Well, uh, three... Free Eye Atlas uh, was discovered on July 1st, uh, 2025, and uh, it has various anomalies. It's very big, uh, at least uh, a million times more massive than the first interstellar object that we discovered. And so that raises the question, uh, why haven't we seen a million small ones before we saw this one? This is the third object from outside the solar system that we discovered. Also, it was... Uh, moving uh, on, along the plane of the planets around the sun, which uh, is very unusual. The chance for that happening at random is one in 500. And uh, it also showed some unusual features, like uh, showing mostly nickel with very little iron uh, in the gas around it. And uh, there was uh, a glow uh, extending from the object towards the sun and not away from the sun, the way we see for comets. Uh, and finally, it arrived very close to some planets uh, that require special timing. Uh, it came close to Mars on October 2nd, and it will uh, come close to Jupiter on March 16th, 2026. And um, the chance of that happening at random is, is really small. It needs to come at the right time, at the right place. But uh, altogether, it's a gift from interstellar space because the fact that it lies in the plane of the planets uh, means that uh, we can observe it with various telescopes uh, on, on the ground, uh, on Earth, as well as uh, in space. And uh, we are waiting for a very high resolution image from uh, the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. Hopefully it will be released uh, soon from NASA. And then um, when it comes close to Jupiter, uh, there is a spacecraft called Juno that will be able to observe it and also use its radio antenna to the to check for any radio transmission from it. Yeah, I would like to ask you about the uh, 3 eye Atlas. Uh, what makes the 3 eye Atlas uh, different from other platforms or on the market? Yeah, so uh, we had only two additional interstellar objects before that. Um, uh, the first one discovered in 2017 and the second in 2019. The first one was called Oumuamua, which means a scout in the Hawaiian language because the Discovery Telescope was in Hawaii. And that one was much smaller. It was uh, of order 100 meters uh, in size, the size of a football field. And uh, Three Eye Atlas is uh, much bigger. It's uh, at least five kilometers in size, comparable to the size of a big city. Uh, and uh, uh, Oumuamua was not uh, showing any evaporation of gas or dust around it. However, Three Eye Atlas does show it but uh, the gas around it has very unusual composition. It's mostly carbon dioxide and not water, as we usually find near comets. And uh, finally, Oumuamua was uh, showing a push away from the sun uh, as, as a result of some mysterious force. Uh, it was not clear what is pushing it. Uh, whereas uh, Three Eye Atlas so far uh, did not exhibit any non-gravitational acceleration. And the question is, uh, uh, today, it's actually closest to the sun. Uh, it's about uh, uh, at a distance of about uh, 203 million kilometers uh, from the sun. And that's the best time uh, for an object that is technological, uh, like a spacecraft, to do a maneuver, uh, taking advantage of the gravitational assist from the sun. We cannot observe it because it happens to be on the opposite side of the sun. It's hiding behind the sun. We can't observe it from Earth. Perhaps for a reason, if its uh, trajectory was designed and it was technological in origin, uh, maybe it will do some maneuver uh, when we can't see it or release some probes that could reach the planets. Um, and so uh, we have to wait until it comes on the other side and see if it exhibited any non-gravitational acceleration, if it maneuvered or maybe released some uh, uh, probes that are heading towards planets. Uh, otherwise, if it's just a comet, a natural object, uh, we might see that it actually, uh, as a result of the heating by the sun, uh, it might have broken up into fragments 
uh, or developed a very pronounced uh, cometary tail that was not around uh, so far. Avi, in, in other interviews, uh, you said that three Ayadlas uh, doesn't appear to be an ordinary comet. Uh, do you suspect that it could be strat extraterrestrial technology? Do you think about it? Yeah, so um, one way to explain uh, the, the size of, uh, the big size of uh, three Ayadlas, uh, uh, which is a big problem uh, for a natural object, uh, is to say that maybe it was not drawn from uh, the, the inventory of uh, rocks in interstellar space because there is just not enough uh, rocky material in interstellar space to deliver an, a, a rock that is bigger than five kilometers once per decade to the inner solar system. You would expect uh, to get uh, such a big rock once per 10,000 years or longer. So one way to resolve that is to say, well, maybe it was targeting the inner solar system uh, because it's a technological object that um, uh, is doing some reconnaissance. Uh, and um, in that case, of course, it's completely natural for it to, to be in the ecliptic plane of the planets around the sun, the way that the Three Atlas is. So these are the main reasons that uh, motivated me to, to consider uh, the possibility that it's technological. And I think, you know, it's important, uh, even though I give it the, uh, the highest probability to be a natural object, I do think that we should uh, consider the possibility that it's technological uh, because uh, of the implications for humanity, if it happens to be that way. Uh, we cannot ignore that possibility. And uh, I defined a new scale uh, for interstellar object where zero means a natural object, 10 means uh, a technological object of potential threat uh, to, to humanity. And I give it at this time uh, a rank of uh, three to four on that scale uh, because of all the anomalies that it shows that make it very different than the comets that we are familiar with from the solar system. Maybe some, some critics uh, say that uh, the hypothesis is so premature. Uh, what do you think uh, about this? What do you say to, to your partners uh, in this? Yeah, so I do agree that um, the object is most likely natural, uh, but uh, often what happens in science is um, that um, you just adapt uh, the most likely explanation and uh, uh, just in order not to speculate or take any risks. That's the standard practice in science, and that's what my colleagues are doing. But they don't realize that this should not be the case when uh, uh, the subject that you are studying could have implications uh, for society. Because uh, in that case, even low probability events must be considered if they carry a big risk. Um, just consider, for example, the Trojan horse uh, story uh, where uh, it looked completely innocent from the outside to the uh, guardians of the city of Troy and they got it in and they didn't suspect anything, but the, uh, the implications were uh, of dramatic uh, uh, impact to, to, that, uh, to the residents of Troy. Um, and uh, in the intelligence agencies, it's well known that you should consider black swan events where you assign a small probability likely explanation, but they uh, forget about the fact that it's different from studying, for example, the exploding stars at the edge of the universe. No, they, they would not have any impact on our life. However, if there is a visitor to our backyard uh, that we think is most likely a rock but happens to be technological, that visitor might show up in our front door and it would be a risk to us. And therefore, we must discuss th that possibility that should motivate us to get as much data as possible to make sure that it's uh, only an icy rock. Uh, A.B., uh, do you think the scientific community, the governments, uh, are prepared to seriously address uh, this detection, this verification of possible extraterrestrial technologies? Uh, the humanity is, is prepared for this? No, humanity is not prepared. Uh, we uh, are familiar with the story uh, of the dinosaurs that were killed by an asteroid the size of Manhattan Island uh, that collided with Earth uh, 66 million years ago. 
And uh, therefore, we have plans for what to do if we notice a, a rock, an asteroid that is heading towards Earth. We could deflect it because we can predict in advance how it will behave. But we've never contemplated the plan of what to do, how to respond to alien technology, a technological object that is approaching us. Because then the trajectory is not predictable, the intent is not clear, and uh, it's a major international uh, security issue. And uh, I recommended to the United Nations and also to the International Astronom Astronomical Union to have a committee or uh, establish some kind of an organization that would uh, collect as much data as possible, coordinate observations of future interstellar objects. These are objects coming into the solar system from outside that have anomalies that do not look like a regular comet or an asteroid. And uh, then once uh, it becomes clear that uh, an object is uh, uh, high on the lobe scale that I mentioned before, it's more than five uh, on the scale between zero and ten, uh, then uh, policymakers have to decide what to do about it. And it's an international matter because a visit by an alien uh, technological object does not care how we split uh, the land on this earth. Uh, it's a concern for all humans. And my hope is that it will bring us together because we would realize we are all in the same boat and we should cooperate. Uh, so in fact, it could have a positive effect on the future of humanity as long as we uh, do not ignore it, as long as we do not say that everything in the sky must be rocks uh, the way that my colleagues in academia are currently doing. Maybe uh, I would like to ask you about uh, this. Uh, what about the media? What about the business? Uh, what should we understand of these uh, three agendas? Uh, what can we do to, right. to do this better in the, in the future? So um, there is a clear um, uh, way to, to differentiate between a spacecraft and a rock. Uh, for example, uh, if we have a high resolution image of it uh, as a result of a camera passing close to it or, um, uh, or uh, if it happens to be big enough so that we can resolve it, then we should be able to tell that uh, it, it, it's not a rock. Or if we see some artificial lights uh, emitted from it or some heat, excessive heat coming from an engine, or most, most easily if we see it maneuvering the way that a rock cannot maneuver. And of course, if we do see a maneuver, for example, after it comes closest to the sun uh, today, um, then I believe it immediately <laughs> that it would have huge financial and political implications. The stock market may crash because of the uncertainty. You know, we are not prepared to protect ourselves and uh, any technology visiting us might be superior to what we currently possess. Um, so I don't expect us uh, to do much on the first encounter, but after the first encounter, as long as we survive, you know, assuming that uh, our, our blind date uh, with an interstellar object uh, will not be a blind date with a serial killer. Um, in that case, if we survive the first encounter, then I think after that, uh, there would be a consensus to establish an alert system uh, that would monitor the solar system and, and tell us about any incoming threat. And that would mean that instead of investing $2.4 trillion a year on military budgets worldwide, we might invest a sizable fraction of that, maybe a trillion dollars a year, on space exploration, uh, putting a system of sensors and interceptors that could uh, potentially get uh, us much better data on incoming technological objects from outside. This is a subject that was not discussed before. Uh, people did discuss uh, what sh uh, should be done in the case we uh, receive a radio signal from thousands of light years away. But in that case, there is no urgency to do something. If you have a visitor to your backyard, you have to decide very quickly how to engage with that visitor, whether to uh, establish a conversation or uh, maybe uh, approach that visitor and, and do something to it. And uh, Avi, uh, what is Three Ayadlas uh, telling us about uh, our place in the in the galaxy? Do you expect uh, a four I in the in the future? 
Yeah, so uh, we have the Rubin Observatory in Chile, uh, which is an amazing telescope, um, uh, 8.4 meters in diameter, and it has uh, a camera of uh, 3.2 gigapixels that surveys the southern sky every four days. And uh, we expect, based on the sensitivity of this telescope, that we will find uh, a new interstellar object every few months in the, in the next decade. So there would be of order 50 or more uh, interstellar objects. And in each case, we should examine whether an object is anomalous, uh, unusual, uh, possibly technological. And that, of course, is uh, a new era. Uh, there might have been traffic in the past that we were not aware of. Uh, but now with the Rubin Observatory, at least in the southern sky, we would know what's going on. And I believe we should build a copy of the Rubin Observatory also to, to watch the northern sky so that we don't just have half of the story. That will be the first step uh, for us uh, making a, us aware of what uh, kind of objects are entering the solar system. And then if any of them happens to be technological, I think there would be an investment of much uh, greater proportion, maybe larger by a factor of a thousand uh, at the level of a trillion dollars in a, a, an alert system, as I mentioned before. And uh, A.B., what would happen if a similar object were on, on a collision course with, with a planet? What could we do? Well, that's an excellent question. I think it really depends on the properties of the object. Uh, um, uh, it's just like when uh, someone visits um, your backyard, um, you have to think about uh, how to respond based on what that, the intent of that visitor is. And so it will be on a case-by-case -case basis. And uh, I think we should, uh, uh, the first uh, rule of a blind date is to observe the other side and get as much information as possible. And of course, you know, this uh, could have huge implications for our future. Uh, it's not clear that we can protect ourselves if the technologies involved are far superior to ours, but we should do our best first to be aware that we have such a visit. Uh, and uh, A.B., uh, what, can we, what can we learn from these uh, three eye atlas? Uh, what can we learn uh, for, for the future? So if, there are two possibilities. Either three eye atlas is a natural object or it's technological. If it's a natural object, it's already quite unusual that uh, it has uh, a composition different from most of the comets we've seen before, including also the interstellar comet Borisov, which was the second uh, interstellar object before Three Atlas. Uh, this one is uh, made mostly of uh, carbon dioxide, and uh, there, there is only 4% uh, of uh, the, the gas around it by mass that is uh, 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 water. So um, we will have to understand where it came from, why is it so big? Um, so it will teach us something about the formation of uh, objects like it, and there must be some factory making them much more efficient than, than uh, systems like uh, the solar system. Uh, it's just different. It's not something that the solar system produced at large quantities. Uh, but if it's uh, technological, of course, uh, we have much more to learn. Uh, how do you launch uh, a, an object that is uh, at least 30 billion tons in mass? That is the minimum mass that this object has, um, or five kilometers in diameter. You know, the biggest rocket we used in the past uh, is a Starship, which is less than 100 meters. Well, uh, we will be uh, talking of, uh, a lot these days about this uh, three ayadlas. Uh, AB, thanks for being here in Northwest TV's pleasure. Having you here, having you here. Thank you, AB. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you for hosting me. It was a great pleasure. Thank you. Bueno, pues eh, escuchaban al científico de Harvard que 